Right, so today, of course, is Rosh Chodesh Kislev. So we ended up being a little late, so we're running short on time. But as we say, Lee Potter, Bele Klumiyevshi, we can't get away without doing nothing. We need to learn something. Um, of course, Rosh Chodesh Kislev is a special day in Chabad, as you know. In 1978, after there was suffered a heart attack publicly in Shul launched me at Seres during a um, They transformed, at the Rebbe's behest, they transformed the Rebbe's office in 770 into a hospital, essentially. They did not want to leave 770, did not want to go to the hospital. So they didn't. Doctors brought everything there. The story of which is detailed, long, and nuanced, and interesting. But the short of it is that on the Shredish Kislev, his health was good enough, he was able to leave 770 and go home. And spontaneously at the time, Hasidim were so elated, he started dancing and singing all night. And that became a day in Chabad, celebrating of his uh, life, essentially. And, you know, for me personally, because of that day, I got to see the Rebbe and get a dollar from the Rebbe, multiple dollars. And all, there was, all the things that were accomplished following that day are really celebrated in some ways on this day, including the major expansion of the Shlichus, the outreach movement, and so on. So it's a special day in Chabad. Hmm. You told me what you told me. Yeah, that's very nice. Okay, we're at the concluding lines of the Mishnah. So we'll conclude the Mishnah and then we'll get to the uh, Gemara on Monday, God willing. So the last thing we had discussed yesterday was a dispute between Ben Azai and Abu Lazar, whether it's appropriate for one to teach their daughters for women to learn Torah. We discussed the parameters of that yesterday and the various different ways of thinking about it, history and the way, it is, the way we think about it, the way they ever thought about it nowadays. And uh, we'll get back to that discussion later when the Gemara analyzes this passage in the Mishnah. The next line in the Mishnah is two statements from Rabbi Yeshua. And it's somewhat tangential, but it's somewhat related. It says as follows, Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua said, right say Isha, a woman prefers the kav to live on a small measure, the tiflus, and be guaranteed intimacy. I'm just translating literally, she, literally then I'll we'll elaborate. She would rather live on a small measure and have intimacy then we test carbon rather than have a much larger measure, more opulence, more food, but precious, but be celibate. So the Gemara is going to discuss this again later as well, but it would seem, at least on the surface, that what the Rishu is saying is that uh, more than financial wealth, a woman wants company, a woman wants to have a relationship with her husband. And uh, rather than have a husband who takes, gives, you know, gives her a credit card, which she can swipe to with, without thinking twice, but no relationship, no intimacy, nothing going on between them. If woman had to choose between one or the other, she would take um, the intimacy on a lesser salary, a relationship, a happy relationship on a lesser salary than a no relationship on a higher salary. And the truth is men are the same way. In theory, or in reality, in a very deep level, Men also desire a relationship rather than lots of wealth. But when it comes to men, for some reason, uh, we have our way of, we have, we have a way of convincing ourselves, nah, we're fine. We just need lots. We, can, we, we have an easier time slipping into hedonism and thinking that, oh, well, I don't want to say hedonism, but we have an easier time slipping into the, the rat race of making millions and convincing ourselves we're happy that way. Even though when we're alone in bed at night, we, we feel empty and, and, and lonely. Um, but for women, they're more, uh, I would say they're more in touch with their feelings like that in that sense. They're more sensitive to what's valuable from the beginning. And, uh, you know, a husband that's going to be rich and a, and, a, and a glector, she's not interested. She'd rather have a husband who's not as wealthy, but won't neglect her. So this is a social commentary from Rabbi Yeshua. Then the Yumara tells us another a statement from Rabbi Yeshua. The Mishnah tells us another statement from Rabbi Yeshua, which again the Gemara is going to analyze as well in greater detail, and we'll discuss it when we get there. But here's what he says: Who are you, Rabbi Yeshua? Would say, 
So it doesn't say Omar he said, but he would say. So it seems like this is the kind of thing he would often say. It's kind of like one of his staple Fabrangans, if you will. You know, whenever she would Fabrang, this would be his theme. I don't know if they had Fabrangans in the same form that we did, I have no idea. But if you were to like give us, you know, a, a sermon of Fabrangan you want to share, it seems like this is the kind of thing he would say. And that is, Chasid Shaita, the pious fool, the Russia Arun, and the conniving wicked one, the Isha Prusha, and a celibate woman, a woman who decides to, um, to, to not to marry, but to, but to, um, to she's being all holy and doesn't want to engage in intimacy with her husband. I think that's what it is. All right, I believe so. Let me just double check, but I believe that's what it is. And we have Marcus Prussian and someone who self inflicts um, pain because he wants to demonstrate how pious this person is. An abstinent woman, yeah. Um, so these, these five, right, it's five, the foolish, pious one, the conniving wicked one, it's four, the uh, celibate woman, and the guy who self-inflicts pain to show how, to show, to show how um, pious and humble he is. So these people on the Bali Olam, these are the destroyers of the world. They're the ones that completely pull the world apart. They erode the world. So what are these people? What, what exactly is this? And why are they so detrimental? See, all these people think they're doing something right, but completely miss the point. What's the pious uh, fool, the chassid shaita? <clears throat> the Gemara gives an example. The Gemara is going to give a few examples, but the Gemara's example is someone who sees a naked woman drowning and says, oh, I'm not going to save her because one shouldn't be looking at naked women. So he thinks he's doing something right, and he completely missed the point. Completely missed the point. Right? There's the story slash joke of two religious Jews walking down the street, or walking down the forest, and there's a river, and a woman, a naked woman's drowning in the river. So one guy dives in, save, saves her, pulls her to the riverbank. Okay, the friends keep on walking. 20 minutes later, one friend turns to the other and says, you carried a naked woman. What, what are you doing? You carried a naked woman. So the friend says, I carried the naked woman from the river to the riverbank, and you carried her till here. <laughs> right? The point being, don't be, don't be a fool. Don't be, don't, don't be silly. And you're going to claim piety. No. A person who's just straight up does the wrong thing. Okay, he does the wrong thing, but at least we know he's doing the wrong thing. We can, there's a clear line. He's behaving, misbehaving. But over here, he convinces himself that he's being pious. And that's why he erodes the world. And the same thing with the next one, which is the, the conniving wicked one. The conniving wicked one is a kind of wicked one who finds a loophole that says, oh, I wasn't wrong. But the more is a, the more is a few examples. Uh, one of the examples is, I want to make sure I'm getting this right, is uh, the, the law is a person who has, wait, what is it? Okay, I don't want to ruin it. We'll get to look at more and we'll see it when we see it there. But basically the, the point is the person finds like, you know, the hairline which says, oh, what I'm doing is not wrong. And look, you see the code of Jewish law says I'm allowed to do it. But in the meantime, he's acting like obnoxious. No, I, it's not. That's not an example the Gemara gives, but I'll give you an example where you know you come into show on someone sitting in your spot, and you uh, forcefully move the guy out. The guy's a visitor in town. Instead of saying Shalom Aleichem, welcome to MTC. How are you? What's your name? Where are you coming from? Get out. The, the, the book says that that my my set space. Be a mensch, right? So again, it's the same thing. Same problem. He uh, thinks he's doing something right, but in reality, he completely missed the point. So in his wickedness, but his wickedness is kind of clever. And he's figuring out how to show that oh, I'm not wrong. Likewise, the celibate woman, she thinks she's being all holy. But in reality, it's not what God wants. God doesn't want celibacy. It ends up causing her husband to resent her. And she ends up, uh, you know, she becomes the woman. She becomes like the guy who carried the naked woman 20 minutes in her mind. She becomes the, the woman who's obsessed with, I'm not doing it. Right? Just have a healthy relationship in a proper way, you know, and don't don't get don't get 
smarter than the law, a little bit smarter, smarter than Torah. And likewise, the person who's self-inflicting pain to show his piety, it's the greatest arrogance. He wants everybody to know how amazing and pious he is, the greatest arrogance, but he convinces himself he's doing it out of piety. So these are the kinds of things it would seem that this is the commonality between all these four categories and why they erode the world. Because as opposed to just plain old evil, which we can identify, that is bad. Finish is bad, it's easy to deal with. But when someone has this whole thing where he convinces himself he's doing the right thing, when in reality he missed the point, it's much more subtle, therefore much more difficult to identify. And thus, we should say, these are the people that destroy or the world crumbles because of people like this, who fool, talk themselves into, um, into foolish ideas. So I'm going to conclude with a famous statement of, I think it was the Rebbe Shab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, would say, would say, you're not fooling anybody. You're only fooling yourself. And what's the big uh, excitement? You fooled a fool. <laughs> Nobody else is falling for this garbage. You're convincing yourself. So who do you fool? You fooled yourself. So you're being a fool and you fooled your fool. You fooled the fool. Clap, clap, clap. Good for you. Miss the point. Be honest. Be straightforward. Know what's right. Do what you have to when it's necess when necessary. Even if you don't think you're the holiest guy when you're doing it. Just do what you have to. And that's what it would seem is the underlying theme of Rabbi Yeshua's statement here. God willing, on Monday, we'll get to the Gemara itself. There's an interesting dialogue, an interesting history of a specific student and where he traveled and where he went and where he got. So that will come, God willing, on Monday. Wonderful day, a good Chodesh, a good Shabbos. God willing, yeah.